Hey everybody, welcome back to another Nature's Always Right episode. Today I'm in Franklin, Tennessee, sitting down with the wonderful Chris Trump, and we just finished a five-day intensive course with him, all about Korean natural farming. Um, everybody had a wonderful time, and we learned so much, so yeah, thank you. So if you haven't heard of Chris before and some of his work, you know, he, he went to Korea 11 different times to learn from Master Cho himself. Um, he's had his farm visited by Master Cho and Mr. Young Song Cho, um, the son as well. Um, so just an incredible amount of experience. He just worked on a thousand acre farm, helping it transition into an, uh, being natural farming. Um, so yeah, very honored to have you with me and uh, to show you guys more if you haven't heard about Korean natural farming. So I guess first off, you know, why, if someone hasn't heard of that and they already grow food organically, why would they be interested in practicing Korean natural farming? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, I think farmers as a, as a breed, we are um, very much uh, a stubborn bunch. You know, we get a lot of people coming with uh, products to sell and we, you know, we, we have to deal with that pretty, pretty much all the time. And so when somebody says, hey, there's this thing, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty challenging for a farmer to be like, I'm gonna drop what I'm doing and figure that out. I um, so I, I'm pretty empathetic to the the uh, new fad conversation being uh, a little old for, for, for farmers. But, and um, this was a difference maker for our farm. We, we were um, farming split organic conventional and, um, and this, uh, this was a big deal for us. So I think, um, the number one reason a, a farmer should look into this or, or watch this interview even is um, that um, a bunch of great for-profit farms all over the U.S. are having a great deal of success with Korean natural farming and affecting directly affecting their bottom line, which is, I mean, there's a lot of cool things and, you know, uh, taking care of the ecological zone where we farm um, and uh, having um, much healthier food and, and, um, and all of that. But at the end of the day, if a farmer can't keep farming um, financially, then it's not sustainable. And I think uh, Korean natural farming gives a financially viable way to um, just farm, take away all the ecological benefits and all the other uh, things that we have going on in the world a uh, farmer can make more money. And so tell me a little bit about your experience with it because um, your family farm is a 750-acre macadamia nut farm on the big island of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Could you go into a little bit of that and um, you know your transition from being conventional to um, natural farming and you know managing a farm like that for 10 years mm. using natural farming? Yeah, it was, um, it was a journey. Um, I finished school and uh, went to work in um, kind of retail design, um, working in high-end fashion in uh, Carmel, California. Um, I, I had to dress Leon Panetta and Bill Murray and a bunch of other execs and, you know, um, and was making great money as a 23-year-old. Um, and. Um, my dad got sick, uh, a random thing, and uh, he's been running our farm now for over 30 years. And um, he needed a little help. Um, he didn't ask for it, it's, uh, but, um, but I felt like it was a, a good time to go there and uh, find something with a little more soul in it, um, heart in it than, uh, you know, high-end fashion. And, um, so I went back and uh, we started asking some questions about how we could do things differently. Um, in the midst of that question asking, yeah, Master Cho's um, information started trickling into Hawaii um, through uh, Dr. Park, mm -hmm. who's a, a, a family practice, family uh, medicine for 40 years in Hilo, Hawaii. and. Um, he saw the need for healthy food because he was watching people get sicker while drugs got better. And um, he, uh, being Korean American, was able to go over, stand for 11 hours, uh, standing room only, listen to Master Cho speak, and then he brought it back and was just sharing it for free to anybody to listen because he wanted to change something. 
and uh, we sat through one of his classes and we left with this like we didn't have the picture <laughs> but we had these we had more questions and um, yeah and then Master Cho yeah arrived in uh, my tiny podunk town uh, in North Kohala on the Big Island of Hawaii. So Dr. Park reached out to him and brought him? Um, it was collaborative. Um, uh, this man, David Fuertes, um, is a big proponent of Future Farmers of America. Mm -hmm. He's a cattleman in North Kohala, and um, he was um, largely responsible for putting it together. Um, he got the um, county of Hawaii involved and um, um, provided kind of a space for learning. and. Um, Master Cho and his daughter Ju Young came over, um, and that collaborative teaching that they did together was um, really the first introduction we had to the details and all the information with natural farming. And uh, I left there and uh, did a 14 tree trial. And that was really, um, you know, we played with it in different ways, but that was really the only natural farming we did for that year. Um, and we saw results. Um, we had a uh, a pretty diseased tree that was defoliated, uh, recover. Um, so it refoliated, it's a, a root-borne fungal disease uh, we have in Hawaii. Um, not totally classified or species or anything, but it's um, Phytophthora, um, a form of it. And um, in, in macadamia nuts, it's macadamia quick decline or macadamia slow decline. We don't have an answer for that in um, kind of conventional or organic practices. And um, IMO um, on the drip line was enough to give that tree what it needed to um, pick better rent payers in its root zone um, and come back. And by year three, it was in uh, higher production than it had been um, before in that block. That refoliating one year later, we decided that we wanted to scale it. So we moved to five acres. And I had all the um, blood, sweat, and tears of a learning journey of scaling because um, they're amazing farms in Korea, um, but by and large, you know, um, single family owned one acre rice farms or um, quarter acre apple farms indoors, you know, really beautiful and amazing produce. But when I had questions about scaling, there wasn't answers. And uh, so it was a, it was a journey. Um, but we saw, um, you know, in all our organic with, we had composting program and um, we bought um, worm castings and made worm casting tea and sprayed it on our orchards. We were never able to get yields. We were never able to get really healthy um, kind of fertile trees. And, um, but with natural farming, we saw, we saw this progression. We did 14 tree trial and five acres and then 50 acres. And we saw the um, healthy trees. We saw results. And uh, for us, we started, uh, we thought our best service to, if this was going to be good technology for agriculture, our best service to the um, community would be to be very skeptical. Um, we started out with a whole lot of we'll see. And uh, even as we scaled it, um, it was still kind of watch and see, does this make dollars and cents? And uh, we ran a 144-acre trial for four years with Green Natural Farming, and um, at the end of those four years, decided that we were going to convert the entire 750-acre farm over. And so we, we stopped our conventional practices on our conventional acreage, and now everything's been certified for organic for over six years. Wow. Um, awesome. Yeah, it's cool. So now you, you, had so, you have a crazy number for your uh, per-acre cost. Did you share that? Share that yeah, you? sure. Um, so again, just caveat, we have other costs. We have other things that go on on our farm, but the natural farming inputs, mm -hmm. which is three sprays of liquid IMO a year, um, cost us $27 per year, per acre. Dang. And uh, that's, that's for the man hours to make it, mm -hmm. um, all the supplies needed to, um, to make it and then the man hours to apply it and the tractor hours to apply it. So you could call that like all of your inputs inputs for your trees and, and whatnot. All, all this stuff, yeah. IMO, all the nutrients, everything, yeah. Um, in addition to that, we do have a composting program too that isn't included in that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and for us, bottom line, um, 
we stopped being able, in conventional, stopped being able to use herbicide, which was, which was a boon. We were happy to not use herbicide anymore, but herbicide created a great deal of efficiency with harvest. Um, we were able to herbicide 10-foot strips where the nuts fell and made it really easy to pick them up. So with, I, I tell people, um, with all of natural farming and our composting, um, we farm for about equal the cost of our conventional uh, farming costs, where we've we've stayed about the same, um, with the addition of now we have to we had to hire somebody another person to mow more. So um, that's how you're getting around it now. You're just mowing. We just we have Phys a physically tighter, rather than chemically dealing with yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. We have a much tighter interval that we need to go through during harvest, which presents all kinds of challenges, but it's doable, um, and it now allowed us to have another employee, which is much more on on track with our mission you know, to provide a living wage in our community um, than spend a bunch of money on yeah. fertilizers and, you know, and yeah. herbicide. Right. And so um, that um, all included, I think, yeah, we farm about the same cost-wise as conventional, and um, yet we are seeing increasing yields mm -hmm. um, as our trees continue to get healthier. We get a premium for organic, and we're... Um, able to have a story about what we do. And so, um, yeah, I think um, in the last six, seven years, our farm has been um, more profitable by maybe more than double. We've made more than double the money we made for the 28 years before we started combined. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, that's yeah. Incredible. It, it's been a it's been a difference maker for us, um, you know. Just the fact, just being able to even farm organically, like yeah. to be able to continue to get our production and not have pest issues. Um, and Chris um, told us on some sort, some conversation, I don't remember when, but his goal is to prove that if you get all these IMO, these indigenous microorganisms, which we're gonna ex explain here in a second, um, if you get them all in place, they will be cycling enough nutrients that you could, and they will persist in the ground long enough that you won't have to uh, possibly apply anymore. That's the theory. That's the theory. That's right? the theory. Yeah. The theory is that <laughs> nature, with a functioning soil food web, with that engine going in, in a way that is as na nature intended, um, it's w well designed, it, it functions really well, and if that's all happening, um, I believe um, that we, we could see a net positive in agriculture where we take off our con our commercial type crop where we're taking all our macadamia nuts and we're still getting that that regenerative effect in yeah. in our you know commercial orchard um without maybe any inputs um and that's trees i mean it might not be the same for row cropping yeah, yeah but right. um no we're gonna have a conversation this summer with my family my younger brothers run the farm now. They're amazing. They um, they have uniquely different skill sets, and they're killing it. It's it's really exciting. We just had launched kind of the long term goal ten years ago or, or longer was that we would be vertically integrated in our industry, and so where we are retail selling our product, and um, that just happened this year for the first time since we started, and so we have three. Uh, we have a salted macadamia nut, a unsalted, and a chocolate covered and they're all natural farming farmed um, organic chocolate and uh, they have our story on the back of the packages so that was really exciting yeah that's awesome well, that's interesting to hear how you're selling them too and we got to try some of them here we got to try some of the raw macadamias that was delicious so creamy yeah that's a special treat you can't buy <laughs> raw, raw macadamia yeah. nuts um, so now let's, uh, we keep saying the word IMO over and over and if you don't know what that is Chris can you kind of explain to us like, why is IMO so amazing, and why do we want? Why do we need to get it everywhere on the whole planet? Basically, <laughs> that would be the dream. <laughs> so we have. I mean, we just we got to be honest with um, degrading environmental factors that we deal with as farmers, um, as people that live on Earth. That um, you know, the some of the stuff that um, impacts nature, some of the stuff we do as humans impacts nature negatively. Um, and in soil, um, what we find is that 
um, while you can knock out microbial life through herbicide or um, other conventional practices or just what the land was used for before we started farming it, um, that um, though bacteria will come back, um, it is, um, fungi doesn't get carried in on the wind. Um, it, it gets transported in natural ways through a deer eating, you know, some soil and uh, pooping in a new place. That's uh, movement of fungal spores. But on a convention or a commercial farm, you know, you're getting very little introduction of anything um, from indigenous fungi to all the other microbes that we need for a diverse system. And so what IMO is, is it's just a um, simple and elegant tool for a farmer to reintroduce diverse indigenous microbiology or micro, microorganisms. And, um, and so um, it's a uh, tool, I say the jewel of natural farming is IMO2. Um, uh, Master Cho would say the jewel of natural farming is a chicken system, right. which includes <laughs> IMO4, so yeah, we're on the same page. But, uh, but that a farmer can go into a wild zone on the outskirts of where he lives or she lives and go up into the mountains or go into a prairie and without disturbing things, um, culture a, a diverse collection of microbial life and then reintroduce those, those, um, those microorganisms that are indigenous um, and will do the nutrient cycling for their farmland. So um, bugs in a jug, um, all the kind of microbe things we can buy as um, farmers are a wonderful um, tool. And uh, they really do help um, with nutrient cycling and uh, uptake for, for crops. But generally they have a fall off of about six months because they're, they're lab grown in Okinawa or some other place in the world or in the U.S. But in, um, and they, they move nutrients, they're, they're great at it, but those, those slight um, diversities in, in genetics, um, the indigenous microbes tend to outcompete them over time, even if there's not a huge amount of microorganisms or they, they fall off in the winter um, because they're... Um, not native. And so um, when you have and you're introducing things from your area, they've self-perpetuated there for a thousand years or more. And once you establish them on that, that soil they like, with the temperature they like, and the humidity, barometric pressure, all of it, they just go to town and they stay. As long as we're taking care of our soil, you're not needing to continue to reintroduce those. And uh, we're seeing that in our orchard. I mean, you kick over the leaf litter as you walk through our trees, and it's spiderweb now. Just everything's just covered in, you know, like, like I found initially in the forest to bring to my farm, now is in our forest, yeah. even though we're, we, have tire, we have tire tracks from our tractors going through there right next to these blooms of beautiful fungi and the worms are abundant now. And, and so it's partnering with nature to grow food. And, um, but in a way that is also like a real opportunity for the farmer to deal with that part they can deal with. Cause we can't always get the higher price for our crop. Right. We can't always necessarily push uh, a crop to produce exponentially more, there is a limit. But when we can take our costs and reduce them drastically, we, we, we can move that, you know, and giving a farmer a tool to be able to move their costs down while maintaining their yields. Yeah, IMO, IMO is 80% of that. I am, you know, having that, that wheel turning under the ground um, that causes our sand, silt, and clay and our rock to be mined into minor minerals made available to the plants. Um, that we get water retention, so we're getting, retaining all the nitrogen from our rainwater. Um, we're, we're seeing it, and we keep kind of scratching our heads every year, like, maybe we are getting a lot of nitrogen from the atmosphere. <laughs> like, I don't know how we're increasing or maintaining yields without adding a bunch of nitrogen like everybody in our industry does. Microbes are grabbing it from somewhere. We're, we're getting our trees fed while not doing anything. Yep. And it reminds me of uh, something Elaine Ingham is famous for, saying that all the nutrients that a plant needs is in abundance in the sand, silt, and clay, 
you just need microbes to unlock it and make it available for the plant. I think we're experiencing that. And that's the, what he's experiencing, and that's this theory that we're talking about being possible, is if the, all the right microbes are in place, they persist for long periods of time, um, there wouldn't be a need to fertilize. And I, it's something I always like to talk about is the redwood forest or the Amazon rainforest or any of these, you know, 100,000 year old forests. Um, who's or, who's or, fertilizing that? Or even oh. Iowan prairie, yeah. where the buffaloes roam, yeah. you know, right. like that was, that was fertile land. You know, it, it doesn't have to be the forest. Yeah. We see it yeah. in the trees, but that was like regenerative land. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and we can, we can tend to that even though we can't take it back to buffaloes coming through once a year. And, and, you know, that's, I mean, maybe not in my lifetime, but, but what we can do is tend to this, this part that we now are beginning to understand. We're beginning to understand there's, there's entourage effect or community collaboration within the microbiological world that if they have each other, if there is actual diversity functioning in your farmland, we're not seeing the disease that we deal with real heavy in, in a lot of agricultural systems. And that by itself, when your plants are, are expressing at a much, they're just healthier, they're able to produce, even with lysed nitrogen, less, more, more health, mm -hmm. you know? And um, so, yeah, I think, uh, I think there's a, a good bit of reasons for a farmer to check it out. Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's endless. And this is just one, well, this is the biggest aspect that we're discussing, but there's a lot of, of other tools in the tool belt that Korean natural farming, and then also Jadam, which is another um, subset of tools that was created by the son of Master Cho. Um, it gives us a whole pesticide suite for treating um, pests naturally, which that's a whole other wormhole. Yeah, and, and those, are, those are pesticides, really. They're just plant nutrients yes. that have pesticidal effects yes. because we're just putting teas made out of plants. Mm -hmm. And so we don't have to go through the whole EPA journey yes, um, right. necessarily. Great tip in the class. And actually, I remember this reminded me of um, when I was in Korea visiting Young Song's farm, and I was asking him about JLF, how often do you use that? And he ended up telling me like he rarely ever uses it because between his JMS, the microbes from JMS, and spraying out his um, JHSs and his pesticides, that there's so much nutrients going into the plant from the pesticides because they're from plants that he's like, that's kind of the extra boost that I give them. And it's a preventative, you know, herbal nutrient for the plant. So that was really interesting, I thought. Pretty cool. So you've been practicing Korean natural farming for 13 years, right? About? I wouldn't say practicing all of that time. In the beginning, it was a, a lot, I guess so. I mean, we were, we were fumbling along yeah, with very, Approximately. But, you know, a lot of this learning for you took place in Korea, and I was kind of wondering what that was like for you as, oh, wow. you know, as someone who lived in Korea and experienced the Korean culture and, and all that, what that was like. And, and I got to experience Master Cho once. Um, so what was it like going to Korea, learning from Master Cho? And, I, I think it was, I mean, a lot, it was a lot of things, but mostly it was really special. It felt, it felt, really, um, felt really privileged. Um, it was, yeah, it was sacrifice to be away from the farm and away from family. But um, over there, um, you know, a lot of us that went in the beginning up until just the last few times, um, it was just Hawaiians, you know, or people, you know, grew up in Hawaii. And so culturally, it's, there's a lot of similarities, you know, yeah. because Hawaii's primarily Asian culture. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of kind of normal um, politeness and you know, all that is um, real similar. But uh, no, I mean, the food was amazing. Um, you know, seeing Master Cho's relationship with these farmers that he's helped over the years and um, that, that was really sweet. Um, he's a man that can, uh, can show emotion and, and be, uh, be uh, real present well you know kind of he, he carries a lot of things you know and so hearing the stories um, that gave perspective on kind of um, kind of the philosophy of natural farming and, and uh, where we come from um, was pretty incredible a lot of storytelling evenings of um, it was invaluable. We'd, we'd travel in buses to different people's farms and 
sitting next to Master Cho and Dr. Park translating and, and having these conversations and getting questions answered and, and, and teasing out concepts that, um, you know, maybe were partially taught. Um, that was also invaluable. I mean, that's, I learned some of the most important things of, of natural farming from those, you know, quiet conversations and, and um, he's always super uh, willing to, to get into it. He likes, he likes uh, intelligent questions, questions with, and, and so he, um, that was, that was super cool. Um, and seeing a culture that has accepted Korean natural farming years ago, you know, uh, a generation ago almost when Master Cho started this. So it's, you know, widely understood, it's recognized the, the fruit from the natural farming farms or the produce from the natural farming farm is prized and uh, those farmers get a much higher price because they're, it's considered some of the highest quality, you know, produce in the, in the country. Yeah, he'd, uh, we'd be at a farm and it's beautiful and it tastes amazing and we're getting shown around the, uh, you know, kind of how they do things. And they, everybody, every farmer I met, they, you know, they do Korean natural farming and they have the little things that they do uniquely on their farm. You know, it's part of natural farming, but it's different. And uh, that was interesting, seeing kind of that, those different ways it flexed and melded to the different types of agriculture we were experiencing, whether persimmon farm or strawberry farm or piggery. And, um, but he would, uh, he'd pause, we'd be talking, we're gathered around, he's talking, asking the farmer questions. He'd always ask him, how much money do you make? <laughs> you know, which was, uh, you know, the teacher can ask that, you know, he's, he, uh, he, it's not, not appropriate in most cultures, but for Master Cho, who has helped them do this, he, he wants to show that as a teaching component. And the guys, you know, su super humble farmers, you know, they're kind of like, oh, you know, yeah. smack them on yeah. the back, you know, <laughs> how much money do you make? Um, and uh, they, they'd abashedly share these numbers that were incredible. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, a uh, one acre rice farm, you know, and the husband and wife do it and it's a hundred thousand dollar, you know, it's like yeah. farm, you know, they're, they're well paid farmers. They get a premium for their product and mm -hmm. they spend almost nothing. Um, seeing the um, Gokseong County um, is a, a kind of a governmental um, body that basically embraced natural farming as the like best practice for their county. And so they created a facility. It's funded by the government there. Um, farmers come in, um, bring the raw materials for any natural farming thing they want, and they leave with the finished product um, made by um, these input makers that are natural farming experts that are employed at this facility to make all the inputs for the farms for their year. And uh, that, that kind of concept that this collaborative, you know, government involved um, community farm pro um, process, we have stuff like that in the US, but just not in regenerative agriculture. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of, it was a glimpse into some possibilities mm -hmm. and, and, and hopes for, you know, change and, and positive directions in our country. And, um, yeah, a, a lot of laughter and some songs, and um, it was uh, it was quite sweet. Yeah, special time. Yeah. Some I said it already, but some amazing food. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah, Korean food is the best. Some of the best food in the world, I think. It's my favorite food. Could you just tell us more about a little bit more of Master Cho's story and who Master Cho is? We keep mentioning Master Cho, but you know who is uh, who is that? You know, he's the person who created Korean natural farming. But could you give us a little more background for those of us who? don't know too much about them. I think Korean natural farming really is what it is and, and is adopted worldwide because of uh, that man's heart. Um, it, as much as the technology is amazing, um, it was also given uh, quite freely. Um, it was the, the, the philosophy he has to share is, is pretty, um, pretty amazingly generous. And, and so I think anybody that will do natural farming, you know, from now on and, and anybody that hears about it, however it helps their farm, I mean, it is by and large a result of that man's generosity with um, some, some pretty valuable things he, he compiled and discovered. And um, 
yeah, he, um, I think uh, mainly his agricultural start was chicken farming. Mm -hmm. You know, he, um, he found and, and learned, um, he studied in Japan with uh, uh, Dr. Venzymes, uh, studied enzymatic theory and, and um, um, studied um, with some other pretty uh, famous uh, Japanese mentors over there. And, um, and then he, he combined it with, uh, you know, tr traditional Korean farming, some, and then had, I mean, he had dreams and, and, um, and uh, things that came to him in the night that he wrote down and, and is an integral part of natural farming. And, um, and he um, has said to me and would say that natural farming is not finished. There's more yet to do, that it's, mm -hmm. you know, our, our generation, we get to continue it. And, um, but he, um, he saw the um, kind of influx of conventional agriculture and he had concerns about it. He thought that it might take the world or the country in a direction that um, wouldn't be positive. And so he took it on himself to be, help provide an answer to um, farmers uh, of another way and give them another option mm -hmm. and to kind of um, hold and carry forward traditional knowledge, um, both from Japan and from Korea. And, um, and uh, in, in his uh, bringing together the, uh, the farmers, because of the time it was in uh, Korea, coming out of the Korean War and the split of the country and, and all of that, um, he um, was considered uh, to be doing, uh, potentially doing communist practices mm -hmm. because they're getting together to make inputs, they're collaborating on, on farm technology. And he, he told us a story of being um, uh, beat nearly to death um, in an in interrogation and they took him out in a body bag thinking he was dead and, and he sat up. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't have all his teeth um, uh, as a result of that and, um, and that, he took that pressure, that kind of backlash from, um, which, you know, uh, might have been just the communist thing. Also, he was messing with the money of fertilizer companies that had just come in. And, um, and he um, was sent out by the Korean church to um, be a um, helper of people, of farmers internationally. He went to um, India. Uh, he worked in Thailand, um, I believe the Philippines. and. Uh, there are incredible communities doing incredible things with natural farming in all these places. Um, I was in Thailand at Meiju University. Um, one of his students um, uh, is Dr. Anat, and uh, he uses natural farming and the resources of the university to regeneratively boost and help agriculture with um, natural um, technologies and uh, the biggest worm farm I've ever seen or heard of is um, there at Major University, and it's beautiful, um, efficient, and um, and uh, so the the heart with which he gave it was was transferred to um, to the places he went, and, and um, yeah. So I've gotten to meet a lot of these communities or, or correspond with um, the people in India, um, and. Um, and in every culture, that looks a little different. But yeah, Master Cho has um, inspired a lot of people, given given a lot. He made a lot of sacrifices. Um, the whole he, that whole family, the Cho family. The whole Cho family. Yeah. yeah. No. No. There's they they did not they were not applauded for a lot of this. There was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears and journey. And yeah, Young Sung um, Cho and and um, uh, is uh, is a master in his own right. You know and. Um, and he's provided a gift. Um, uh, Cho Yun Sun uh, developed a first ever sulfur um, uh, recipe to make a, a water soluble, a liquid sulfur um, that is uniquely better than anything on the market. Yeah. And he open sourced it. He gave mm -hmm. the technology away for free. And you know, I want to hang out with people like that. Mm -hmm. They're they're good. So try and transfer that culture here in the five day classes and and in communicating it because um, I think that is a lot of the beauty as well, that we can be um, in connection and in community um, in agriculture and um, working with something that um, really causes the whole tide to ride, rise for farmers. Um, so yeah, Master Cho's uh, given some gifts to humanity.
Absolutely. Um, if people would like to get in touch with you, learn about Korean natural farming, like we just did for five days in this amazing in-depth class, uh, they can go to ChrisTrump.com. ChrisTrump.com is my website. Yep. Yeah, there's um, free downloads there, um, links to a lot of my free YouTube. There's a lot of free education on YouTube. I mean, really, if you have a little uh, a little go get them attitude. Um, most of the information is free on my YouTube. You know, you can make all this stuff, and it's it's doable. It's there's a learning curve, mm -hmm. but um, so that's just Chris Trump. You just search Chris Trump on YouTube. YouTube. I'll put a link uh, for everybody down there to his Instagram, his YouTube, his website, and uh, we can announce that yeah, you have a, an amazing online course coming out about Korean natural farming. Yeah. is this the first one ever that's ever been? Uh, this is the first one I've done, and uh, and so it's basically a five-day class, a lot of footage from five-day classes, um, some downloadable resources, and kind of takes you through uh, a learning journey, um, knocking out your sections, and um, yeah, and once purchased, it's yours for life. You know, you just keep being able to rewatch and and to do this, and a lot of the details that aren't available on the free YouTube. Um, just because it's 40 hours. I mean, the class is like a whole lot of, and nobody watches, you know, or most people don't watch six hours of footage, yeah. you know, but in a class structure, it kind of makes sense. So yeah, I, I got a lot of feedback that, mm -hmm. hey, I'm in, you know, Nairobi, and I want to take your class, but I can't fly to the US, you know, and so this is kind of, a, um, you know, the goal is to continue to further it and, and uh, world takeover. That's right. <laughs> For not not me taking over the world, but natural farming um, taking over our agricultural world, and uh, so yeah, that you go to chrisstrump.com, um, com, go to courses, and you can you can purchase a full online class, and um, you get a uh, certificate. I'm not super big into certificates or certifications. Mm -hmm. I think this is just a tool for farmers. Do what you like with it, but um, we do also um, foster um, further learning. So we, I have a. Cool a program that people can learn to teach too. Awesome. All right, you guys. Well, thank you so much, Chris. It's been an honor yeah. to get to learn from you and spend a lot of time with you and, and uh, just transferring so much knowledge to all of us so that we can go out and, and spread these uh, microbes everywhere and grow great food for our farms. Yeah, Stephen, so. thanks. Thanks for hanging out this week. It was fun.